So good morning, and I want to welcome you to a panel A1, uh, Writing Beyond the Classroom, Developing Student Creativity and Workplace Readiness. I'm Doug Hesse, and this is Liz Kimball. Um, we're each going to introduce ourselves as, as we talk, but I just want to orient you that you're, you are in the right place, I hope, I give you a chance to exit if not. When I was a sophomore, I spent um, about an hour in the most confusing class I'd ever been in, and I thought, dear, and I realized at that point I was in the wrong room, of course, and I said, 20th century American literature really is about this? It, it wasn't, of course. Um, so we've got lots of technological fun here, so humor me a little bit. So again, I'm Doug Hesse. I teach at the University of, of Denver. Um, I'm the uh, almost past uh, chair of AWAC, and um, I've also had some roles in NCTE 4Cs and other things. Um, and recently, most extensively, I've been uh, writing about uh, creative nonfiction, and just last week had a a book that I edited with Laura Julier come out from the Whack Clearing House, House on Nonfiction, Teaching, Writing, and the uh, Influences of Richard Lloyd Jones. So that's enough about me. Um, so for today, um, creative nonfiction across the curriculum, and I, I hope you will note the, the very important question mark that is the only difference from, I think, the title in the program. Let's see. So it's Labor Day, and I'm in a mountain cabin near Crested Butte, Colorado. The owner has warned us to close the windows at night. There are tiny gnats in vast numbers, and they're getting through the screens. They're drawn to the light. So it's night. I'm reading in bed, brushing bugs from pages. The book I'm reading by David Kaiser is Quantum Legacies. It's a collection of 20 essays by an MIT physicist, essays with titles like All Quantum, No Solace, From Blackboard to Bombs, Gaga for Gravitation, University of Chicago Press. Kaiser is exploring particle and quantum physics, providing plenty of fact and theory, yes, but often doing so through stories and portraits of scientists. The blurbs on the book, Nobel laureate Kip Thorne says that Kaiser's prose, quote, soars in a remarkable series of vignettes. The reviewer from Physics World calls the book, quote, a breath of fresh air to see physics written like this, lucid and friendly, sober and thoughtful, and willing to trust the reader's engagement and intelligence rather than demanding the former and underestimating the latter. Now, the book has enough formulae and graphics uh, to earn serious credentials, at least to this layman's perspective, although I'm, I expect that physics graduate students might sneer at, at the baby level physics going on. But the book also has analogies and reveries, as in passages I've highlighted here. The book is closer to Montanian essay than Newtonian treatise closer to journalism than textbook. It's written for readers who choose to read it rather than are obliged to read it. There's a long vein of similar physics writing um, from the 1970s, Capra's The Tao of Physics to uh, Zukov's Dancing Wooly Masters. Biology has had Lewis Thomas, The Lives of the Cell, Late Night Thoughts on Listening to Mahler's Night Symphony, some of the things, Jane Goodall's My Life with Chimpanzees. In fact, this sort of writing has become popular enough to join the Best American series. So there's a Best American um, Science and Nature writing, along with essays, short stories, poems, travel writing, food, and any number of things. So this writing is out there. It's fairly popular. It sells well. Um, but it's pretty far from what we would have students write in undergraduate courses, especially across the curriculum. 
The question I'd like to pose for the next 18 minutes or so is why not? That is, what might WAC do with this sort of writing shaded under the umbrella of creative nonfiction? When I proposed this talk a few months ago, I promised, I promised creative writing across the curriculum. You see, I put in a question mark now. I'm speculating, but um, hubris still couldn't help me writing that we'll call this CNAC or better snack, um, creative nonfiction across the curriculum. Um, the most pretentious word maybe in the title though is still across, which promises examples from a range of disciplines. I'm going to focus uh, on the sciences, mostly due to lack of time and talent, uh, but I think I can extrapolate what this might look like in uh, other fields. I won't belabor uh, creative nonfiction definitions, I could wax at length, uh, but I'm referring to a confederation of factual genres that have aesthetic, stylistic, and authorial features historically associated with fiction or poetry. That is narrative, image, metaphor, voice, dialogue, the whole shebang. I'm pointing to genres like memoir and the personal essay, to literary journalism, to autobiography, to profiles, place writings, and so on. I'm happy to define it further um, if you would like. But I'd like to focus really br briefly on three qualities of creative nonfiction that I think are most apparent in the popular, quote, science writing that I've uh, sh shared with you. First is a strong presence of story and scene. Ideas and concepts are narrativized. The writer takes readers on the drive up to the observatory or into the bar with the botanist. We see the mood of the lab at midnight. There's dialogue. So again, this is from Kaiser's book. Um, you, you see it replete with you know, the introduction of where the conversation took place. What was the story of how did they get there? Or in th this uh, essay by L L Lacey Johnson about slime mold, of course, um, you, know, you, you have the scene set. Um, so first, lot, large presence of story, setting, and, and so on. Secondly, the ideas are associated with people who figure as agents and characters in the piece. Um, and especially this is true of first person narr narration. Ideas are always located with someone rather than just being disembodied out there. So uh, again, some examples. Um, these are all from the, the, the best American science writing, nature writing. I've had a relationship with water since before I was born. Um, Faye Salinas does not want your sympathy. So again, the presence of people as characters. Third, the writing is often associational, sometimes even digressive. It doesn't stick to the point. It's got to make time for stories, associations, memories, connections. Um, is sometimes digressive. A fact or idea gets connected to other facts or ideas, sometimes mediated by experience or memory. The writer values these connections, even taking leaps in the names of creating interest for themselves as well as for others. So if I'm writing about a new image from the Webb Space Telescope, I might, it might take me to watching the Milky Way galaxy uh, way above Crested Butte, Colorado, on a dark, gnat filled night. It might take me to 1968 in an Iowa backyard, lying on a blanket beside my mother in August to watch the Pleiades meteor shower. There's a modest tradition. So those are the three qualities I, I, I want to pay attention to. There's a modest tradition of creative writing to foster writing to learn, we all know it. Its roots go back to, uh, at least as far as research that James Britton and his colleagues did with British school children in the 60s and 70s. 
They theorized a spectrum of writing roles ranging from the writer as spectator producing poetic discourse. And notice by poetic, it's not in the sense of sonnets, but in the sense of producing artifacts meant to stand as artifacts rather than as transactional. Um, and the other role, of course, in opposition to the spectator was the participant, the transactional writing. And I gave you a little half sheet if you want to rib um, the, the famous diagram from, uh, from Britain's book um, that shows these triangles of spectator, participant, and so on. The spectator role, which I want to focus on a little bit, is to observe, evaluate, and create. Britain writes, in a very general way, the distinction between the roles of participant and spectator is the distinction between work and play, between language as a means to buy and sell, to inform, instruct, persuade, and so on, and an utterance for its own sake. No means but an end, a voluntary activity that occupies us for no other reasons than that it preoccupies. And again, I think it's not hard to see where the creative nonfiction I'm talking about falls on this. Between transactional and poetic discourse, between getting things done and creating artifacts, written, posited, expressive discourse, writing to create meaning for the writer, with the only logic inventions that matter being what the writer needs to produce the text. Again, this is whack 101 stuff here. Writers beginning in expressive discourse may, as they move toward external readers and their expectations, shape writing to meet transactional or poetic conventions. Or they may fashion expressive discourse for publics. And you'll see on that diagram expression in, in the middle as, a, as an artifact, and not just only as a mode in which the writer chooses, quote, to approach his reader as though he were a personal friend, hence revealing much about himself by implication in the course of dealing with this topic. This, I'll observe, is the realm of the personal essay. It's the genre that Ed Hoagland characterized as living on a line between what I think and what I am. In an essay for another time, I could tell you about drinking beer with James Britton in 1979 or 80 in Georgia's on Market Street in Iowa City when he was in residence for an NEH uh, summer seminar. Actually, it wasn't a summer, it was a year-long seminar. Story, character, digression. The centrality of expressive discourse is to foster learning space. Uh, and this idea got taken up early by prophets like James, uh, like Janet Emig, and later by gospel writers like John Bean. Expressive writing was mainly instrumental, important for learning, but paving the way to transactional purposes, perhaps. Poetic discourse, which Bean largely reduces to creative writing. I, I love Bean's book, this is not a criticism. Um, but creative writing and poetic discourse are almost absent from that. While Bean does include creativity exercises, there are three of them among 25 examples that he produces, at least in this first edition. Um, now, there are exceptions, uh, more places for poetic discourse. Um, Art Young's 1982 chapter in Language Connections, uh, talks about the poetic function of language. But, but really, this is something that, oh, here's a means to an ends rather than stuff that we might produce in themselves. There's relatively little about creative writing uh, generally in the WAC literature. It's usually as a sort of throwaway example. There's some serious work. Think of, of chapters by Alexandria Perry or uh, Justin Nichols about creative writing. And, um, but even in that, there's not, there's almost nothing about creative nonfiction. Um, that's kind of remarkable when I think about it. I mean, you'd expect that fact-based narrative um, in the name of creativity would be fecund for content-driven writing. Um, 
I speculate there are three right reasons why we haven't paid much attention to creative nonfiction in WAC. Um, one, you know, there's just, just, I think, a general reluctance about creative work in the serious business of WAC. Even in writing to learn, there's a sort of suspicion that it's the easy way out. I wrote a poem with the word rhizome in it, so good for me. Um, you know, I think we're suspicious. Um, second, uh, creative nonfiction has been, you know, relatively recently de defined and popularized. And it's been around for 50 years too, but I don't think it's insinuated itself in, into um, our imagination in the same way that, that poems and stories have. Um, third is straight out that, that straight out poetry, fiction, and drama are not only more familiar, but they're safer in some ways. Uh, I, I'm going to elaborate this in a little bit, but the, the idea that, of course, if somebody is writing a poem, we're not holding them accountable for the content in the way if somebody is writing nonfiction, uh, the, the stakes get higher. Creative nonfiction's absence is perhaps a vestige of um, a phenomenon that James Jim Porter described in his 1980s landmark article, Intertextuality in the Discourse Community. I, I'm just really curious. I'm just, how many of you know that article? Okay, that's a matter. I, I wondered if there would be a generational thing. Um, Porter, among other things in this piece, describes writers first as pre-socialized, that is able, um, they're, they're sort of kept outside the disciplinary ropes, they don't, haven't earned their way in yet. Next, writers are socialized, that is, they're able to perform conventions sufficiently well to gain membership. Then some fewer are post-socialized. This is a last level reserved for people who have demonstrated they can do the stuff. So now they can do something extra and different. Um, so Neil deGrasse Tyson can write personal essays and so on about astronomy because he's done his chops. He's done his work as an astronomer. Um, so I'm thinking in that post-socialized category of writers like Stephen Jay Gould or Neil deGrasse Tyson. I wonder if, if the idea of having students write creative nonfiction violates some kind of unstated decorum. They haven't earned the, the right to do creative nonfiction. Um, just a thought there. With that background, I'd like then to, to consider um, more directly some rationales for creative nonfiction or snack. I can't bear my, uh, I say it twice, that'll be the last time, I promise. Um, surely, after all, we need better reasons than that, you know, some belletristic MFA Iowa type like me likes the genre, so by golly, you're going to like it too. Um, though maybe I'm not alone in liking. Um, Alexandria Perry makes the case that uh, creative writing supports different learning styles, aptitudes, and interests for students, and particularly in general education. I think that's a, a good warrant. Um, she also argues, eh, that's overstating it. She suggests that creative writing is an invaluable transferable skill. Students who have taken a creative writing course see improvements specifically in the areas of critical thinking, the maintenance of a healthy writing process and close reading. I'm not necessarily convinced, and I think transfer scholars, I'm looking at you, Yancey, might call time out on that claim of the, the uh, ubiquitous transfer of creative writing. But anyway, poss possible rationale number one, cognitive growth. Wax fundamental promise, again, has been um, that compelling or inviting engagement through writing inevitably builds learning. Creative writing's contribution is to have students remove course material from usual disciplinary rhetorical situations, then make use of them in imaginative contexts. For example, two, two quick assignments. Write a dramatic scene involving two characters having coffee. One of them wants to ban the novel, The Hate You Give, from a high school library. The other believes the book belongs there. Write that scene. 
Among things you'll need to establish or figure out is the relationship between these two characters before the scene begins. Or two, write a poem that uses the following words, mycelium rhizome. You might, for example, have your poem describe a family or a set of relationships. So, you know, creative writing is cognition. You're dealing with, with these things in a different way. Scholars who have advocated creative writing across the curriculum have focused mainly on writing to learn. One challenge I see is the tension between addressing course content and creating an artifact of reasonable quality. Artistic considerations vie with facts and concepts, as, especially as one might move from expressive to poetic discourse. Making a good artifact can become more seductive than grappling with a concept. Characters and images for many students are sexier than mitochondria. I'm trying to figure out whether this tension is relieved or enhanced with creative nonfiction. I will say that first person works like essay and memoir introduce a variable of creating content with lived experience. And how do you keep intention? I want to write about me versus I want to write about that stuff. Possible rationale two, credentialing the precept of, of writing in the disciplines is helping students acquire the rhetorical and epistemological moves to mark themselves as players in a disciplinary orchestra, even if they're last chair, second violin. There isn't much room for creative nonfiction, I think here, uh, except for advanced students. The goal after all is socialization in WID, though we might uh, expand our sense of what socialized as a scientist means in terms of writing for publics. Um, Rightly or wrongly, I think we expect students in WID situations and credentialing to do so through following customs. Um, maybe it's even a kind of hazing. Maybe it's a necessary hazing, I don't know. But I remember when I was in high school, my calculus teacher, Joe Beck, his name, made us learn a very tedious method of solving certain kinds of differential equations. And after we had struggled that for a few weeks, then he said, oh, and here's the shortcut way to do it. Um, he, he told us it was good for us to, to do all of the hard work. Uh, and even as a high school kid, I thought, no, it was good for mathematics <laughs> that we did that. Possible rationale three, communicating. Communicating effectively within a field is a m matter of credentialing, of course. Uh, for readers planted in a field, obliged by circumstance to read the text of the field, um, writing that's direct, jargoned, just the facts, ma'am, may be, both be sufficient and desirable. Um, but what about writing for readers who aren't obliged? What about writing for readers of, say, the New York Times Science Tuesday section? I do think the next big challenge that LAC faces is having students write for bro write broader publics. Um, Higher education increasingly calls for professors to work as public intellectuals, uh, climbing beyond protected spaces. Uh, and I know firsthand, for example, that writing a 750 word piece for the Washington Post on machine scoring of, of writing is a very different prospect and much harder than doing this talk for all of you in this room. Um, I suspect we don't trust or wouldn't trust undergraduates to do that public kind of writing. Um, but I think, I think we should, and I think I should find my place. I think we should have students consider and practice strategies to make readers care about the things that they're learning. I'm not just meaning tasks like explains photosynthesis to your grandmother or explain to your boyfriend Martin Luther's objections to the Roman Catholic Church. I'm meaning going beyond the course content and using strategies of creative nonfiction to make outside readers aware of and care about subject matter that you don't necessarily want to expect to encounter on their own. Number four, connection. 
And this resonates to some of the provost's uh, comments this morning and to Cameron. Of course, I hope that creative nonfiction might, might ember engagement in some students, making them care differently about a subject matter. When I've done this with English majors, inviting them to write creative nonfiction, they've written with enthusiasm. So have students in an inter interdisciplinary seminar that I teach on, on mountains, ecologies, and imagination. Uh, I'll give you some examples if we have time. But I'll just say that giving students the position of creative nonfiction writer gives them a kind of agency they don't have. They, they are bringing things to make the text and not just, you know, in their minds, finding the right way to write about this content. Um, that said, you know, I, I have great uh, respect and experience of the promise of it. I have few delusions that asking every student to write creative nonfiction will be epiphanic for them. You'll get the yeah right um, as, as much as that as any. But by connection, I also mean something different and bigger. I mean building relationships between subject matters and other aspects of their lives. That's an old fashioned liberal arts ideal, I think. But it's important and really pretty hard to have students perceive the discrete coursework they're taking, not only as building career skills and content knowledge but also as building themselves as learners and seeing their education and their ideas existing in the context of their own lives and the lives of others, not as coming in portals, staying there and then, and then leaving. And I think creative nonfiction, the idea of how do you make somebody interested in care, largely using stat strategies of story, character, digression, complication uh, is, is a way of doing that. Joan Didion writes that we live by the, her line, imposition of a narrative line on the shifting phantasmagoria of experience, the imposition of a narrative line. And surely that experience might include what students are learning as topics in classes. How might creative nonfiction look? How am I doing, Liz? Oh. Okay. Wrapping up, I'll, I'll give you three quick examples. I'm happy to share this talk. Um, option one, a stint as a literary journalist. I'll call you, the, the, you know, this is maybe the New Yorker approach. Assignment to student, portray a class session topic or unit in the form of a feature article for a widely read serious magazine. You have to get the subject matter right, of course, but you'll also have to solve the challenge of making this interesting for readers. One approach is through narrative, embedding the information in the story of the class. What's the classroom like? How about the students? Might you interview someone? What are they like? What images can you create for readers? Include quotations or summaries from, you, you, you see where this is going. You know, the New Yorker reporter shows up in your class uh, for a week and writes a piece for them. Um, option two, write a personal essay. Write an essay that deals with or grows from an idea in this class, perhaps even starting as report and reaction. You might begin by exploring your response to an idea or two. Why? In other words, what in your life or outlook or the world may connect with this idea, why and how? Ahead. Option three, memoir. Tell a story about a week in your life in which this class figures in some meaningful way. To do this, you might keep a series of notes about the class, meetings, homework, readings, as well as a journal about your life during the stretch of time. Then mine those materials for pieces that you'll include in a memoir that features this class. Note that I'm saying features rather than is exclusively about. Um, again, time won't let me go further, but um, so let me give a couple of examples uh, and then shut up. So I mentioned earlier an interdisciplinary seminar I teach. That's probably my favorite course. Um, 
that I've taught in the recent years. But you can see uh, in this particular course, I give students a menu of six, sometimes as many as nine choices, and they have to write about three of them. And you can see that the first three assignments here are fairly standard, um, dealing with course concepts and so on. Um, but the fourth one, and inevitably students choose this. Now, mind you, these are students who come to the University of Denver, they take a class about mountains, so it's a pretty self-selected group, but the idea of writing a memoir about an experience or set of experiences in the mountains, um, they do things like, oh, and here are some photographs, let me talk about the, the geology, let me talk about critters I see, and so on. Um, but a very different way of engaging what's going on here. Or uh, last example, and then I'll close. Um, in a course I just taught this year, it's introductory topics in English. Genre, canon, the literary, rhetoric. I mean, these are all topics in the course. And so you can see for their final project um, this past quarter, I gave them four different topics with the third one, your own reading, writing, schooling as a work of creative nonfiction. So you're going, oh yeah, literacy, autobiography, got that, know that. But it's very different when you've just spent a course reading a dozen interviews with writers um, about their writing and literate experience. Of the 18 students in the class, 16 of them, not surprisingly, did this option. And it's wonderfully thoughtful work. Um, I'm, I'm going to close. I could go further and and uh, probably should have planned better. But I, I just want uh, you, you to think a little bit about the place of some kinds of writing where students are making poetic in the broad sense of, of Britain's uh, term, discourse out of class materials and what its value might be, especially in connecting education's parts to students' own lives, but connecting the school world to the the other world in which we all live. So thank you very much. Trying Liz to find you here. There you are. Thanks everyone for coming this morning and, and thank you, Doug. It's such an honor to speak with you. Um, I am Liz Kimball, AKA Elizabeth. Uh, I'm the director of the university writing program. Is that too close? Oh, or too far too? Okay, sounds so echoey. Um, director of the university writing program at Drexel in Philadelphia. I've been there since 2018. And uh, our program is uh, the, essentially the writing center and a WAC program, which is um, uh, writing intensive courses. It has a lot of development to be done, um, but it, it's also been set up by some great people and has a lot of great stuff happening. And so um, I have been that director for the past year and I've been thinking about how I want to develop it, moving it forward. Um, what I want to talk about today is really about bringing in who I have been and what my work has been um, prior to there and how does that actually sort of fit with the writing program and the WAC framework that I'm now finding myself in. Um, the question that I'm asking is how could WAC programs be useful in thinking about um, writing beyond the university not from the perspective of what students might need or want or demand of us, um, but rather could the model of a WAC program of something with a particular kind of administrative structure, a particular ethos and a, and a history of lots of challenges that we have learned from um, actually be useful for um, creating some new kinds of partnerships and, and uh, public intellectual work um, and, and sort of pragmatic, making a pragmatic difference. Um, 
when we usually think about writing composition and rhetoric and writing studies types of efforts that go beyond the university, typically we've, that has developed in other corners of the field, right? Coalition for Community Writing, um, obviously all sorts of research on workplace writing and things like that um, and technical writing, uh, maybe something like the Rhetoric for All project, which is um, doing lots of sort of important um, work with public memory and a whole, a whole range of different kinds of topics. Um, but it seems like to me, as, as I have sort of understood it, is that WAC is still primarily uh, a student and faculty development sort of inside the university kind of movement. Um, I am going to sort of posit here that in fact, there's lots that could be done to sort of bring the two together, a parallel move kind of similar to what Doug has been saying. Um, and I was reading back through some of the um, kind of you know, foundational types of things thinking, have I been missing something? Have I been misinformed here? Uh, maybe I have, and you can tell me if I am. But I started reading sort of with a, a kind of different set of glasses on to think about how um, a WAC program could be something that is not simply a university-based program or that is based in a university, but um, has some sort of um, connections beyond it in some deliberate and intentional ways. Um, here's something from the intro to the critical source book collection, which is over 10 years old already. Um, and I think it's interesting that uh, the writers describe uh, that WAC leaders must be willing to act in entrepreneurial ways and move beyond their comfort zones, engage with sometimes unlikely partners and projects. And then they go on to name sort of university movements, things that happen within university institutions. Um, but then end with globalized future. Um, if you took out their examples, I think you could name a lot of what I'm going to talk about today. Um, it is a way that I am wrestling with coming to terms with being entrepreneurial. So I come from, you know, more than anything, probably a small liberal arts college kind of background and coming into Drexel, which is a STEM university, um, very um, proud of its 100 plus year old co-op program has been very career focused and makes a big deal about being entrepreneurial. Um, how I've sort of come to, to terms with that and have started to think about it that maybe it gives me more than I thought I ever have liked about it. Um, here's another interesting move that I found um, in one of Joan Mullen's articles about faculty development. Um, she was writing about the writing fellow model and how that was a, um, uh, what one of my colleagues used to call stealth faculty development, um, a way of creating a, a third person in a triangulation with, with students and faculty that ends up creating some sort of change that's sort of greater than the sum of its parts. Um, the, the writing fellow model highlights the need for students, professors, and facilitators, whether it's a tutor or a faculty person, to mutually engage in the knowledge building within a class. Um, this idea of uh, knowledge building being something that happens when there's kind of a third element in the mix, some kind of catalyst. Um, what the mentor does is facilitate pedagogical change and effectiveness by serving as a fulcrum for the give and take of teaching and learning within a classroom. So I love that metaphor of fulcrum because I think that is um, the, the thing that I'm thinking about. And if you take out classroom, and if you take out student, and you take out professor and mentor, and you replaced it with workplace, and um, let's say organizational leadership or director and staff and whack person, <laughs> um, then what happens? Um, we're not learning in the sense of, um, educating for credentials and for grades and for degrees, but the organization is tasked with learning and moving forward. Um, I think that WAC could be actually a very helpful structure for, build, for bridging academy and professions if we stop thinking about how, what we are ultimately trying to deliver for college students. Um, I think college students can be along for the ride in many ways. Um, the affordances and constraints of WAC programs offer the framework we need for conceiving 
and building new kinds of porous collaborations with organizations and workplaces. Um, and I, it's the porousness that is um, what I will tell you more about. Um, I realized what we could do is we could start to think about WAC less as um, an administrative structure or as a, a educational movement, um, but more as a genre in the sense of social action genre and genres that can be translated. We can see how collaborative and inventive and resource challenged traditions that we have um, all struggled with uh, could actually be translated in settings beyond the university because we've got all kinds of unusual skills for creative and imaginative approaches to very difficult bureaucratic and administrative problems and, um, and overcoming the genres of, of disciplines and teaching that you know, prevent, um, prevent growth in teaching and learning, right? That, that could actually be equally useful for organizations. Um, these programs could transcend either better educating college students or helping employees write more effectively. So I'm not just talking about, you know, if we could, if we can help students and teachers learn about better writing, then we could help organizations. I'm talking about something um, more having to do with, with growth and um, helping the organization do what it does better, which I think ultimately is what we're all in it for as, as WAC professionals too, right? It's, it's not so much the words on the page in the end. Um, so here are some opportunities for what I see as WAC style partnerships with organizations and, and workplaces. And in a minute, I'll tell you more about my own. Hopefully that it'll make more sense. This is organized in sort of the most obvious way to the least obvious, and it's organized from um, the most uh, kind of generic, commonly understood perception of writing. I don't need to explain what that is to our more complex definitions of writing. We could bring our definition, we could bring writing to organizations, uh, our definition in parentheses, because that will emerge over time, just as we do when we work with faculty and other disciplines. Um, the organization that I work with, when I started getting involved with them, they said, great, our staff really write terrible emails. You could help us. <laughs> um, we are very worried about the, you know, their, their grammar. Um, I said, yes, I can do that. <laughs> I didn't tell them, let me tell you about linguistic ideology. <laughs> um, beyond that, uh, working with people to think about style and organization and the sorts of things that, you know, we usually know that we're really talking about um, when we work with writing. Um, ease in developing documents, that sense of, um, uh, fluidity and, um, uh, oh, I can't think of the word I mean, um, being able to, to get a writing task and not be completely stymied by it, right? Um, that in the organization that I'm working with said, oh, everybody's terrified of writing. Um, you know, can you help us with that? Yes, we can. Um, perhaps moving down the ladder in terms of foundational shifts and cultures that uh, really are the, the more important outcomes here. Creating cultures of collaboration and review where people are more comfortable working with one another, addressing one another about their ideas in ways that are direct and productive rather than fearful or um, uh, where you're, you're holding back on what you really think because you are think it's not political and then all that happens is poor communication and hurt feelings and you know politics and clicks and things like that. Um, those are the sorts of things we teach if we are working with peer review and critique and the, the, the rhetoric of deliberation. Right? Um, from there, imagining and inventing new possibilities for what the organization can do and where it can go. Um, those, when you get past the initial sorts of uh, conversations about this piece of writing before you, this grant proposal or whatever it is, um, you know, what if we, what if we start to think about X? The organization that I'm working with is starting to do that. Um, and creating a learning organization that creates ethical change, ultimately, is I think where this could head. So those are sorts of some of the um, kind of operational things that might happen. 
I think there's some secondary opportunities or maybe they're primary opportunities or maybe they're motivations too. Um, I think this kind of work could be a cost-effective way for organizations to invest in their own growth. Um, there are all sorts of organizations that will lay out plenty of money for consultants of this, that, and the other thing. What we do is whack people is come in as the non-experts and sort of facilitate the change slowly within the person's own milieu, right? Within their own genres of knowing and doing. Um, we're used to being kind of broke. <laughs> um, I think a lot of organizations might be willing to work with people like us um, uh, on a much different fee structure than if you were hiring somebody to say, come in and you know, do some kind of fancy strategic plan or something. Um, and this is the last bit that I have been researching and I'm curious to hear if anybody else uh, has their own stories or uh, knowledge about this because it's been a little hard to discover. Um, could this be a source of revenue possibilities for our own programs? In other words, kind of selling our services as a form of consulting um, that both brings in some money, uh, which I know my university would welcome, um, creates a little bit of independence for us as programs that we could then put back into investing on campus or wherever we wished, um, but could also um, be something valuable for the programs themselves by partnering with us. Uh, I've created a model that I come to call humanities at work. And one of the reasons I chose the term humanities at work and not writing at work uh, is because I wanted to get grant funds. And I think that there are lots of uh, more funding in what people recognize as humanities and what people recognize as writing. Um, that strategy has paid off. I'm part of um, a Mellon grant that we just got at Drexel that was half a million dollars. So that's been pretty cool. Um, I also got some funding from my own um, college, the College of Arts and Sciences. Um, so it's, it's, it's been a useful term. It's a little bit confusing though. So um, it's nice to talk to kind of an insider audience who actually understands what I'm talking about here. Um, I'm really thinking about a definition of writing as, as strategy and change. Um, part of the project that I do is actually a community-based learning course. This is where the partnership really came from. Um, and it was a course that I was assigned when I was hired at Drexel because they were starting a new um, writing studies concentration in the English major. And there was this course they had created the year before I got there called Writing for Social Change. I came in as kind of the CBL person and they said, oh, Liz, this must be exactly the course you want to teach. Um, I don't think it was really, but it was fine. I took it and ran with it. Um, and the, the partnership that I have worked with um, has been really valuable in developing this course and then developing the other work that I do with the organization. So uh, it's a social service organization in Philadelphia. Um, the university supports me in the community-based learning course, which happens once a year for 10 weeks because we're on quarters. Um, the whole rest of the year, I'm actually working with them as an independent consultant. Um, so it's, it's there, there aren't, just to be perfectly clear, there aren't funds coming from the university, coming from the organization to the university. They're paying me directly, um, but it's, um, part of what Drexel actually seems to encourage us to do quite a bit. Uh, this is the organization that I work with. It's called USEF, which is how they pronounce it. It's a little bit strange. Um, this is uh, the cover slide from uh, one of the PowerPoints that we developed with the staff that they use now when they give public presentations. Um, USEF stands for Utility Emergency Service Fund. And it was originally founded in the 80s as uh, the pass-through organization, the clearinghouse for utility grants. So if you're low income, um, every month the budget is a squeeze. The utilities are often the first thing that you don't pay, right? Because you got to pay the rent or you're out um, and you got to eat. Um, and the utilities, because they're you know publicly mandated, they can't cut you off quite as quickly as some other things can. Um, so that you, so 
your electricity and, and gas and heating bills tend to be kind of a leading indicator of, um, of trouble down the road. So it's not just that you're behind on your utilities, it's that um, there's sort of the, the canary in the coal mine that you're housing insecure and homelessness is you know, a potential. Um, the director of the organization uh, really saw that as um, a chance to transform the organization from simply this place that gets all this money from the city and from the various utilities and um, you know, funnels it through to people who apply for grants to actually turning that into a way to address housing and security more broadly and all that that entails. Um, not addressing homelessness so much as creating a situation where homelessness is not so likely. Uh, and here's what the organization does. They've now got a whole range of things that they offer people that you can see are um, uh, sort of complementary to the utility grants, right? So um, financial assistance, food assistance, they do workshops, they really work with people in this holistic kind of way. Um, case management is still up there, but we've actually had lots of conversations about not even using that term anymore. They often call them uh, family advocates. This is essentially an organization full of social workers. Um, they've gotten involved with the city efforts, doing all kinds of um, sort of neighborhood renewal projects, taking whole blocks of row homes that are you know, suffering from one kind of disrepair or another. People in Philadelphia has a tradition of home ownership but uh, that passes down from generation to generation. But at this point, the, the housing stock is so old and people haven't been able to invest in keeping them up. So it's like, okay, you could, you know, you could solve this $10,000 debt on your water bill, but your plumbing is in such disrepair that it's leaking all the time anyway. So um, projects to kind of bring whole neighborhoods back into um, some kind of, uh, you know, safer situation in terms of the infrastructure. Um, so this is the public face of the organization, as you can see. Um, here's the people I really work with. <laughs> um, the guy in the center was my boss before I went to graduate school when I was a, a young college grad. Um, and he really taught me how to work in an organization. I all, we often have this um, kind of story that we tell. I was 22 years old, I had to write a grant proposal I had been an English major and knew how to write lots of literary analysis papers that were guaranteed to get an A. Um, <laughs> uh, but I brought this grant proposal to him and he was so embarrassed to tell me that it was just terrible um, because he's a sweet guy and doesn't want to deliver bad news. And I said, well, that's okay, it's just a first draft. And I went back and, and worked on it some more. And he had never heard that concept before <laughs> and, and thought, she is teaching me things, uh, which was, really a lovely thing to say because I, I don't think I was teaching him much of anything at that point. Um, so in many ways, I think I taught him composition. He taught me rhetoric. <laughs> uh, he would, we would have partnership meetings with people all over the city, all kinds of different entities. Um, in Philly, things are, it's never not political. Um, and he would make us sit down ahead of time and map out, okay, who's gonna be there? Who's going to say what? What are their interests? You know, what do we want to say? What do we want to not say? And it was the first time I really understood that there was strategy and sort of how you went to work. You didn't just show up um, to the meeting and like see what happened, right? So um, that idea of sort of process and strategy has has actually it turns out been really important to me over the years. Um, I later went to graduate school. I dropped all of this community work. I didn't think about it for years and years. Um, I studied at Temple with Eli Goldblatt, who was doing tons of community work. And I actually said, Eli, I'm just here for life of the mind for a while. I'm tired of that. <laughs> um, and here I am back to doing it. Uh, this is the, the organization at the Veterans Day Parade. They all came out in their blue shirts. Um, here's some of the women who run the individual programs speaking at a housing conference in Harrisburg. Um, and we worked uh, ahead of time to sort of plan their presentation that they were going to give and their the PowerPoint that they created. Um, they're really terrific and, and know a ton of stuff. 
here's the kinds of things that I've done with Yousef then over time. And I'm talking about everything other than my community-based learning class. Um, I've been an editor, just simply, you know, editing grant proposals and all sorts of other documents. I've often been the writer, writing the copy, um, helping the, they have a grant writer, um, but she really wasn't trained as a grant writer. Um, probably would land in a basic writing class if she were enrolling in a university where they were placing people in that way. Um, we've worked back and forth. So I've coached her a lot on writing. Her writing has really improved a, a huge amount since I've been working with them. Um, I don't always need to, write, to do the writing anymore. She'll often write it and then we'll work back and forth to make sure it's um, in you know, go shape for the public. Um, sometimes this is, this is morphing in more directions now. I've often become an employee coach, sort of you know, helping people just develop as part of the organization. Um, the, there was a human resources director who was asked to write kind of a, you know, a plan for HR and she came back with something that they really weren't happy with. And um, I was the, you know, again, like that sort of writing fellow kind of model was able to step in with her and talk about the situation. What is the organization looking for? What do you, you know, she was insisting, I'm the HR professional. This is the only way it can be. <laughs> um, and I was saying, well, the director is thinking about, you know, our employee development in this way. Um, so we were able to work that out together. So it was less about the document that we were creating than her relations with the organization and her understanding of her identity as an HR person. Um, we've done all kinds of professional development. I'm going into a series where we're going to be working on um, kind of writing workshops slash planning with individual units. Um, there's a unit that does the utility stuff. There's a unit that has a um, giant grant with the the Veterans Administration, there's a unit that works with schools and the community schools program in Philadelphia. Um, so we're sort of developing those individual teams. I've often become the communications expert, the, you know, the public communications expert in, in terms of whatever gets put out there for what gets seen about the organization and advising on that. Um, during the uh, George Floyd, the murder of George, George Floyd protests and all the organizations coming up with like Black Lives Matter statements. I was in sort of emergency mode with the, uh, the director advising him on what to do. He was about to make a huge mistake in saying nothing. Um, I helped him read the articles about the Art Museum in Philadelphia, which was coming under an enormous amount of pressure for having said nothing. Um, it was a lot of, helping people doing what I think is a very kind of Bakhtinian sort of thing. Like they were saying, we're this great organization. We have, it's largely African-American staff. We don't need to say this. Um, that's stuff that's happening out there. And I was helping them sort of translate and understand what's important about it. It turned out it was actually incredibly important to the staff and they were about to have a huge revolt if we didn't do something. Um, so I've been able to, to kind of navigate that, bringing in, some skills, understanding discourse and paying attention to kind of social justice narratives in ways that the director wasn't necessarily because he's really been focused on other things and has a different kind of um, kind of political past and history and, and relations with the city and the city's history of race relations. If you asked the director, John, what I was doing there, he would say I'm there for strategic support. Um, his mission, he uses the phrase shared societal prosperity, his mission, um, his vision, how we get there and then how that translates into what we do every day. Um, he sees my role as also providing some um, kind of uh, status or cachet because he's able to say, I'm working with this professor from Drexel University and I never wanna say, you know, you're not working with somebody and like, the School of Public Health that could actually advise you on some of the really important issues that you're working with. Um, but he does say, you know, you're the director of writing. That's really important for us. So he kind of understands um, why I'm there in a way that that adds something that's more than just what he's, um, it's that he does understand that it's more than writing good emails. Right? So those are all the things I do with Yusuf. Um, I didn't want to talk too much about um, my actual 
community-based learning course, but um, just to give you a, a sort of a brief, a brief overview of it, that happens once a year, and that is what we call a side-by-side -side course at Drexel. Um, students are coming in and working with staff, and we kind of have a like humanities kind of discussion. We've we've read um, like Ta-Nehisi Coates' stuff on reparations. We'll read a lot of poetry, often local. And then we'll start to sort of look at, you know, the, the writing for the organization and documents and things like that. So the students are sort of getting some like professional writing, nonprofit kinds of stuff. The staff are sharing their experiences and, um, you know, what it's like to be them, right? Um, and then we're pairing that with some kind of like humanities, you know, kind of history and literary understandings of the situation that we're in and why Philly is the way it is. Um, so that's what I do. I have also spent some time looking to see if there are comparable models. And again, maybe somebody can tell me that you know of one, um, but it's been a little bit hard to find. Um, there is a movement for workplace writing centers, um, also oddly enough in, in Philadelphia, but a completely different milieu with the Federal Reserve Bank. Um, she really describes a writing center that looks just like a university writing center, but it's at this bank. Um, a little different from what I'm doing. There's the public humanities movement, which I've gotten involved with. Um, here's just two examples that we're doing some interesting kinds of things. Um, there's another public humanities project that is now its own nonprofit that I didn't put on here um, called Reflection Point. Has anyone heard of this? Um, this is a woman in Cleveland. She had been an English professor um, and it's a professional development program where she comes in and she gets local faculty, I think often from Oberlin, to work with organizations and they read short stories together. Um, so kind of similar to what I do in my class a little bit, um, but she's now her own independent nonprofit. Um, and then of course there's community-based learning that I'm really drawing from quite a bit here. Um, Drexel's Writer's Room is another really prominent kind of public writing project that's much more social justice oriented. Oddly enough, not oddly enough, probably for real, um, Writer's Room actually started within the university writing program as well. Uh, and they've since spun off, they now report to the Dean and COAS in College of Arts and Sciences. Um, and they're now their own independent unit. So what I'm thinking about is really, how can I do this kind of thing in a way that stays within the university writing program and benefits it? Because I don't want or have the desire to create some whole new independent thing, whether it's my own you know, organization or, or another center or unit within the university, um, I think it might be better to sort of stay together with the writing program. Um, and then there's a whole other field called human resources development, which is often in many ways kind of doing a lot of what I'm talking about and they have their own sets of journals and terms and you know, paradigms and things like that. Um, and I think that's another kind of genre translation place that I've been reading about, but I haven't really you know, tried venturing into as a human being yet. Um, there are also, I think, some models like this at other universities around. My predecessor, Scott Warnock, had actually done quite a bit of research to try and discover them. And he told me about a number of schools. Um, I hesitate to name them because they don't have like public materials about this anymore. Um, but perhaps some of you come from one of these schools or perhaps you come from another one. Um, could this be a revenue model? There's individual consulting. Um, could we set up a, a fee structure where it's like institution to institution? Um, is this just beyond the pale and not what a WAC program should be doing? I don't know, but I'm wondering if there's possibilities there. So what's next? Um, I am going to keep developing this, this partnership. Uh, I'm going to keep researching it. There is a precedent at Drexel. Uh, Scott had had some grant money to do this kind of thing and, and with changes happening, we didn't quite do anything with it. Um, but I'm really curious to open up and hear from the rest of you what you think might be next and what kinds of overlaps and potential partnerships there are. So thanks. We've got time for questions or comments. 
if you have a question, I'll bring the microphone to you. Thank you both. Oh, is this on? Oh. Okay, very good. So, um, and thank you both. That was wonderful. And Elizabeth, my, my question for you is about if any of your projects might also include looking at alums who are at maybe some of these, you know, partnerships beyond. And one of our WI faculty and advisory board members had really encourage this um, for us in, in our writing program at the University of Missouri to think about how can we leverage more opportunities with alums finding out so it's kind of a mutually beneficial thing you know what are they experiencing in the workforce how did their writing at MU prepare them for that but then also when I'm thinking about it and what can we continue to do to continue that partnership and and that learning opportunity so any thoughts on that I did a bunch of um, research because I also teach a course called Academics to Careers um, for graduating English majors to you know think about how do they bridge. And I so I brought a bunch of alums back and we did some sampling. Um, it was fascinating what they were doing, and I also thought it was really helpful when um, the interviewer prepared them, even though they couldn't imagine at all what it was they would be doing. You know, they had all spread out into all kinds of different fields. So yeah, there's definitely lots of potential. And I, and I think more and more, there's lots of really well-trained undergraduates in like sort of writing studies doing work like this a lot. Um, I know my friend Eleanor Long at um, Arizona State worked on that, has, has really cultivated some really great um, relationships with students who then are going on and doing some interesting things and she's kind of following them, so yeah. I'm curious, Liz, if you have thought about or could talk about what you see as the impediments for this model sort of within the, in the university institutional system, specifically within writing program systems. As you were getting to the end of your talk, I was imagining many possible impediments, but I don't want to presume that the ones that I'm imagining are the ones that you're anticipating. So. Well, one of the reasons why Scott Warnock stopped trying to develop it was like, um, that he couldn't figure out the writing. Um, and he's another guy who's really entrepreneurial and did a big job. And it always became, and I think some of the people who've done it have really become kind of more well. So, why about it? And, and then, you know, other people are doing what I do. Yeah, they need quite a bit on it. Taking your own money, with your own credentials, with your own resources. On there. <laughs> um, on the other hand, uh, in in doing our work on campus, we this also predates me. This is Scott, but he started working with the business school. Um, they have a doctor of business administration. And they came to him and said, you know, we want to do all these workshops, and by the way, here's what we pay you. And suddenly it was, you know, the business people are like, well, of course there's no way exchange. <laughs> um, and and that money every year has toppled off on our budget. Um, and so that's why you know we keep thinking of it's this there's gotta be some some changes here that would be good for us because people would actually Really do have an audience. Yeah, but if anybody's like you said, other yeah, okay. <laughs> okay. It, it seems to me that for some time now, well resourced fields like medicine and business have created ways for people to incorporate writing to use writing to write better um i mean i'm not going to say how many years ago i worked with a doctor who was working on a book about biz you know doctors using writing and 
creating business models for their practices. And I wonder if there might be things to be learned from programs like that um, that are already well resourced. The other thing, and this actually goes to the question about impediments, I think in our time, it's risky for the university to go out and say, yeah, we can teach you how to do this. I mean, and I, I guess I would feel cautious about that. And I, I wanna think how can we turn what you're learning back toward how we teach students to go out and do that better? How can we enlarge the idea that students have about writing and how it relates to the things they do so that they go out well-trained to move into positions? Um, I have a daughter who works in public health and the organization she worked for often, they, they had, well-paid and interesting jobs as writers and editors. Uh, and she would forward those to me. And when I would look at them and think about the training students at my university were getting and the requirements of those jobs, I would think, not so sure they're going out able to do those things. So can we learn from the world out there how to do better for the students we teach? Yeah, and that has been a really fun thing about the course because the students come in, they're still writing for civics, but they come in from you know, all the civics to learn how to do that. Um, and they come out thinking, oh, you know, you should all be really interesting in civics. Living in I think they come out much more nuanced as well as possible because they've been working with And the, I mean, I'm sorry, I've had English majors and uh, English majors like the minor and all um, the There's just something about that because the students have all the you know, other schools. I, like, I just had an engineer who was up to be doing her thesis in mechanical engineering, but she had to three months of putting away in home uh, gardens. No, like, what do you call them? Yeah, like, kind of, yeah, like in home hydroponics that made them, like, you know, universal days of things that everybody has. And, and you know, she, she really used the class and said, I just like think through how I do this and what kind of yeah, it, I know it's, it's um, you sort of don't want to give it away, but only in giving it away, we're able to go to organization and the students sort of get the perspectives. Thank you. Maybe time for one last. I, I just wanted to say, Doug, I really love your ideas. And where I am right now, I'm trying to build a WAC program. We just started doing bachelor degrees a few years ago. And our students, we have very low admissions requirements and our students struggle. So the idea of engaging them in creative nonfiction would be a way to maybe get some of the professors who could assign writing without focusing on, hey, you didn't document this exactly right. Hey, there's a grammar error right here, but focusing more on ideas and engagement than on you know, all of the, hey, you have to fit in this tiny little mold. So I appreciate it. I took lots of notes. Um, do you have a article or a book where you go into more detail on this? No. <laughs> But, but I'm, I'm, I'm working on it. Well, I mean, I, I'm interested in that. I, I do think class plays a little bit. In terms of, of the inclusion, um, how does this particular course intersect with your life and education? The point uh, gives a way in, and, and it's, you know, it's, it's writing invitations are cast as much as. One that you know this stuff, or that you're learning this stuff, and just explain yourself to me. 
or creed. I, I, I think there's some roots work there. It's just, you know, this is woefully under under theorized at this point in my mind. Um, I do think that the idea of, I mean, the, the reading side of this is to um, have students read some creative nonfiction related to this field, whether it's on the platform, memoirs, or interviews with people, so that they see that these figures who are producing knowledge in their field actually are people with fuller lives and interests. Um, I mean, I think that's a way of inviting people into this rather than here's an unassailable wall of discourse that you need to find your way through. But, um, no, I'll, 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 I'll work. I mean, I've written a lot about creating nonfiction, but not in terms of why. I think with that, we're, we're going to kind of close it another session in 15 minutes. So thank you.